Welcome to Lessons from the Legion. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you for staying this long. As I say, let's make the most of your time. Let's make the most of this. I, I love this venue. Let's make the most of it. So, I have a question. If we're all so smart, which we are, the people you've talked to today, the people you've been, you've talked to and been taught by yesterday, if we all work so hard, and you know how hard we work in this industry, how many hours we work, how much effort is put in, why does everything in cybersecurity feel or is so awful? After this, you'll have questions as well. Uh, my contact details will be at the end. All references will be blogged. I would love to stay and discuss this. I am very interested in your feedback, good or bad, as long as it's constructive. However, I have a taxi booked for the last Eurostar at the country, so uh, please get in touch afterwards. All media is, of course, owned as copyright. If I haven't credited it, it's probably from Pixabay, as per that picture. Now, this should be like a nice linear structural presentation, but it's really more of an investigation wall. You know how detectives on the TV and films, they're trying to solve a mystery. So you have a wall of ideas, of clippings, of photographs, and the lines of string between them trying to figure out what the solution is. This, this is my investigation wall, but it's certain parts of it. My investigation wall is like about a week long. We have about 40 minutes. Also, this is called a remix because I've given this presentation before, but I either emphasize or de-emphasize certain points depending on what I think is relevant to you. Also, as not like some of the other talks we've had today, a lot of my ideas are seedlings. I've got half an inkling of something. That's why I want to present. I'm interested in what you think, what other people think, whether the idea works or not. To start explaining what I think, I've basically borrowed slides from someone else. Win the uh, Cyber War with Zero Trust by John Kindervag, field CTO of Palo Alto. He explains the four levels of war. Uh, grand strategy, strategy, tactics, operations, traditional kinetic warfare. Those are the four different levels. He then translates that to cyber war. In cyber conflict, in the most general terms, the grand strategies basically don't get hacked. The strategy, from his point of view, is zero trust. The tactics, the tools and policies, the operations of the platform. Now, I like the fact that he talks about strategy. There aren't enough conversations in this industry at a strategic level. I'm not sure about zero trust, but strategy, I think, is where we need to operate in. Because thinking about tactics, thinking about whatever you do within... Whether, whether you're a developer, and even if you are a developer now, you're also in security operations, you're also in system operations, you also manage infrastructure. If you look at the a summary of the tactics that we use in each of those positions, that summary is basically this. It's you, long hours, working on your own, becoming the best technical practitioner you can be. It's all about improving your skills. How you've got to where you are today is by improving your skills, by training and knowledge, most often working on your own with passion. passion and passion sometimes means enthusiasm. Sometimes passion just means evenings and weekends. And I, I'd argue, and this is stretching the analogy in the same way, when we build anything, something automatic, a web application, infrastructure, anything we put onto the internet, we basically build it the best that we can, best that we can, make it as secure as we can. We then wind it up and then just send it out there on its own. It's build a web application, put it on the internet. If it gets hacked, then we'll build a better web application. The actual thing we build is to send it out there on its own, make it as good as we can. That is the tactical way we have thought and learned and the way we think in this industry. So, where has this approach got us? When I was started giving this presentation along this theme a few months ago, according to Breach Level Index, the website that tracks data breaches, you can see there since 2013, that's about 10 billion. Looking it up, I think it's the same figure as yesterday, maybe this morning. 13 and a half billion records stolen, 
depending on where you stayed to attend this conference, this might concern you. In the last couple of hours, that figure should go up by 500 million because of the breach at the Marriott stroke Starwood hotel chain. And according to literally, I just looked at headlines because someone let me know about that. I noticed someone looking in their bag already for whether they've got a card. You see there, uh, you know, figuring out which hotel they stayed at. Another 500 million, just why we've been here today listening to talks. There was a blog post by Rapid7 from the RSA conference earlier this year, looking at the rise of CVEs. It's not exponential, but it's such a massive increase. And the way that Rapid7 put it in their blog, they said it was the same heavy hitters. It's the same companies with the same kind of CVE over and over again. Organizations not learning lessons. You look at the Global Risk Report from the World Economic Forum. So threats, looking at threats to civilization, to our entire species as a whole. Uh, global extreme weather events. So a couple of thousand years of the effect on the planet overall is there. Cross-reference likelihood with impact. The most significant risk, risk to humanity. Over for cybersecurity, we've been doing this for what, 50 years, 40 years? Uh, we've managed to get there. So, you know, well done, everyone. So, I think the problem is that tactical approach. You learn on your own, you think on your own, you um, improve your technical skills, you improve your technical prowess. That's what makes you a good security practitioner and how you are regarded and promoted in this industry is based on how good you are compared solely or almost arguably solely to how good other people are. And it reminds me of this. At about 54, 55 feet. So we're going to work through the same drill, get into the same position. And from here, we're hitting the putt so solid. That's the biggest difference that I've seen. This is how you practice. It's you, your tool set, your ability, and a static field of play. When you play golf, it looks like this. It's you, your tool set, your skills, and a static field of play. Your teammates will not help you. They will encourage you, they will advise you. The caddy might give you advice. Your enemies, your adversaries, I mean in golf in terms of your opponents, the opposing team, will politely watch you play. They won't throw a ball at you, they won't throw a club at you, they won't move the hole, they won't dig three holes, they won't dig bunkers. Does this feel like your day job? Now you might say, well, Nick, what's wrong with golf? There's nothing wrong with golf or practicing for golf if you're going to play golf. And I don't think we're playing golf. I think we've had like a a golfing tactical approach, which has become, oh, I don't know what happened to the middle side there. Basically, from we've had a tactical approach that has become a strategic approach of golf. Our entire strategy is uh, a golf-like approach to the game. How can I be the best player I can be? How can my app be the hardest, the most secure it can be? How can my organization be the hardest it can be? As I say, I think we're following a model of the wrong game. Now, this way, sort of saying, well, the way we study is like a sport, but it's the wrong sport, so what sport should we look at? It's quite a weird and analogical way of looking at things, but I think it's what we need to do. We need to look outside of our industry. And looking around for some kind of justification to think this way, to think, well, the best way to solve cybersecurity is not to look at cybersecurity. I came across TRIZ. TRIZ is an acronym for whatever is Russian for the theory of inventive problem solving. Basically, there was a Russian uh, inventor and science fiction author looked at all the inventions that people had made in about the 1950s. He looked at the characteristics of the problem they had, problems they'd solved. He looked at the patterns in their solutions. And he realized if you take a sufficient level of abstraction, rather than being precise about a specific engineering solution, you can use other people's solutions. The kind of solution you are looking for, someone has figured it out already. 
in sort of strict engineering terms, if you want twice as much power but not twice as much weight from your power source, someone else has figured out how to do that. Rather than doing it in your specific discipline, look how someone else has done it. Now, TRIZ is massively complicated. I haven't gone into it. But I think the central principle applies. You've got your problem, the traditional approach. You just think about your problem. You get more and more experts on your problem in, and eventually you'll break through that wall and you'll get to the solution. Or the TRIZ way of looking at things. You look at the way, you look at the world's conceptual problems, you look at the way people have solved those problems, and you just get over that wall. You can save yourself so much resource and maybe decades. That's what I think we need to do. Now, speaking to one of the world's lead international consultants, uh, Daryl Mann, he said to look for a solution, look for someone who's suffering a more extreme version of your problem. So that's where I've looked. And I really think we need to. I think as an industry, we're at what I'd describe as a, we're at what I would describe as a strategic inflection point. An idea stolen from management consultancy. Basically, a company keeps doing what it's doing and just does it more and more and more. And eventually, it, it just needs to change. The environment it's in has changed. In the same way, another idea taken from management consultancy, the idea of jumping to a different S curve. You put more and more effort in here. And you just, and it pays off and it pays off, but then you put more and more effort in and you get less and less reward, which feels like our industry. You have to jump to a different way of thinking. That's what I, that's what I think we need to do in this industry. So how do we do that? Which S curve do we look to jump to? Because I think if we were playing golf that we've practiced for in a golf-like way, we would all look that happy. And I don't think we do. I think if you, Look at your processes, look at your situation, look at the emails you've had to answer today, look at the working week you've had, look at what you're looking forward to next week, maybe the emails you need to answer tomorrow at the weekend. I think computer security looks and feels a bit more like this because we're trying to play the wrong sport. So I think we need to understand the game we're in. Look at your day, think about your day, think about your peers, Think about your colleagues, think about your managers, think about your customers. And most importantly, think about your adversaries, think about your attackers. I think our industry looks, sounds, and feels a lot more like this. Come on, defense! Whoa! Whoa! Hey, party just began, baby! Hurry up, hurry up! Gun flex right stack, 394 dragon smoke. Kill turbo sucker right. Hurry up! Gun flex right stack, 394 dragon smoke. Kill turbo sucker right. The Patriots drop into coverage in this play. This is a form of a combination coverage. You have to be kidding me. That is impossible. We know our assignments. We know our alignments. We know our schemes. You tired? You tired? Hurry up! The only thing that matters is a win. That's it. However, whatever, whatever it takes. Like I say, let's make the most of this excellent stage I've been given. Um, so, yes, you've all stayed this long for me to say. Cyber security and American football are the same thing. And I really genuinely think I am onto something. From the outside, utterly complex, make absolutely no sense. Gun flex right stack, 394 dragon smoke, kill turbo sucker right. What on earth does that mean? Yet look at what, take any of your non-technical friends and relatives, bring them to this, say, and think about what you've been told today. Everything from the encryption for Tesla keys to the code you saw for modifying mobile applications. Utterly incomprehensible from the outside. Fantastically complex. Part of the challenge is just how many variables there are to consider. Something I is in like the week-long version of this. They're both team games. Both the teams you work with and the teams you work against. Incredibly highly specialized. If you've seen a game... 
uh, you'll see the players will line up. Well, basically, they both, they have a meeting. Then they all line up in the middle. Then they wait. Then they ram into each other and have a fight. Then literally, it seems like the entire team leaves and another team comes on for the next five seconds. Um, because of the specialization, depending on the different position you're in. And again, look at the industry you're in. Incredibly highly specialized. You think of all the different roles we have in this industry. Because of the different situations and also offense and defense, red team and blue team. In the NFL, whether you've got the ball or not, offense and defense. Complete offensive and defensive playbooks, ways of thinking, ways of working that have been built up over years and decades apply to cybersecurity and the, and the NFL. And it's a fight over territory in both cases again. It's also that point, the fight over territory and the specialization that also means we have so much in common with the military, with military conflict, with war studies, with um, war fighters, and we can learn from them as well. And thankfully, uh, Condoleezza Rice, former Secretary of State, is attracted to both American football and, uh, I mean, her interest in warfare. It's simply that strategy and the goal of, the goal of taking territory. There's a lot to learn from people in a similar but more extreme version of their situation who've solved their problems already. There's a lot to learn from war gamers, military modelers, military simulators. So, what can we learn from football and who should we learn from? Now, an American football team is so big, you've basically got an offense, you take the field when you've got the ball, and a defense, you take the field when you don't. So we're defenders, I think we need to learn from the defense. So looking at the defenses you could learn from, I think we should learn from the Legion of Boom, the Seattle Seahawks defense from 2011 to 2017. That was mainly the nickname of their three most significant players. Uh, Sherman at cornerback, Thomas at free safety, Chancellor at strong safety, but he sort of covered everyone. We should learn from them and from the philosophy of their head coach, Pete Carroll. As I say, it's everyone. Now, the reason why an NFL record for four straight years, they led the league in how few points opposing teams scored against them when the opposing team had the ball. So that's an NFL record. And there's many other statistics. I'm happy to have the sports arguments over Twitter over the weekend. But basically, I think there are significant lessons to learn. First lesson to learn from head coach Pete Carroll. Shift left your conflict. In sports terms, practice is everything. I mean, what we want to do is what Pete Carroll wants to do, is win forever. And for him, practice is everything. Practice is the same as playing the game. Now, as I say, an American football team is so big, that's all the coaches and trainers in blue, all the players in white. So you've got those two teams, and also you've got first-string players who tend to start the game and second-string players who come in particular situations. What that means is you've got a second-string defense you can play against your first-string offense in practice sessions, and a second-string offense you can play against your defense. So you have a second-string team called the scout team who can imitate whoever you're going to be up against. So if you're playing the Oakland Raiders on Sunday, your scout team can wear their uniform, uniforms, their shirt numbers, can call their plays, run their formations. So by the time you play the Oakland Raiders on Sunday, you've been practicing effectively against the Oakland Raiders for the last five days. The game is not a big jump. That's what we need to do. And I realize shift left is not a massively new concept, but this is the justification of why. For your red team, for your opponent, this is what we need to look at. A concept from wargaming, from military simulation. There's literally, apart from slides of my other presentations, this is the only picture of it of the, on the internet, the Caffrey Triangle, figuring out what you want your red team to do. What happens in the military? Stimulate the game objectives. Can you just sort of be there and be shot at by the new tank we've just spent $300 million on? For cybersecurity, I think often incorrectly we're here, win at all costs. How good a pen tester can I be? How smart can I be? What's the best way, the biggest number of ways I can attack you? What actually matters is here. Follow doctrine, imitate genuine attackers, figure out how they would attack you and your application and your network and imitate them. Understanding that this actually matters and you need to make this decision in advance is something to learn from war gamers, from military modelers, military simulators. 
and it's part of their threat modeling. Yeah, I mean, as Adam Shostak says in his BrewCon keynote, get yeah, threat modeling in as early as possible. I mean, the Death Star is a great example of leaving it till the last possible moment. Just get that threat modeling in early. Which, I mean, is what you can do with Zap. I mean, as per the talk we had earlier today. I mean, not only is it now more usable, but as per the stuff we were talked about yesterday, it's just... The, the, my eyes were open so much to the API, how you can integrate it into your security development lifecycle. So just your, your application has been practicing against opponents all the way through its development. So by the time it's on the internet, it's not that little wind-up robot you're sending out on its own. It's battle-hardened applications that you're putting out there on the internet. And this, and this is a massively long string across my investigation wall. Reminds me of this amazing paper, The Base of Sand Problem, written by Rand military consultants in 1991. They basically looked at their multi-million dollar industry that affects people's lives, affects the future of countries, and said, we are looking at conflict incorrectly. We are modeling it incorrectly. We have looked at this massively complex situation and we are getting it wrong. To grab some parts uh, from that, particularly footnote three, battle outcomes have historically borne no relationship to the raw force ratio. Looking over hundreds of years of military history, what matters is the ratio of effective forces. You don't need the most resource, which is what we're trying to do. We're always trying to hire more people in cybersecurity and there's more products and there's more companies. It's the ratio of effective forces. It's the smart use of what you've got, not just grabbing more and more resource. And this reminded me of this tweet by Jeremiah Grossman earlier this year, highlighting the Kenner report, that only 2% of vulnerabilities are actually attacked. Why are you trying to discover 100%? Why are you trying to fix 100%? Focus on what your opponents are actually exploiting. And there's a good post from Jeremiah Grossman explaining this more what vulnerabilities matter and so on as well. So I think that's the first lesson. Practice is everything. Conflict is business as usual. Send your applications out into the world. Battle hardened. Concentrate your forces. Stop trying to figure out and fix everything. Second lesson, eliminate the big play. Another central part of Pete Carroll's philosophy. He's been coaching for like over 40, 50 years. Now... I'd love to explain to you, especially with more clips, the Seattle Seahawks cover three defense with a single, single high free safety and a four zone underneath. But all you really need to know about the Seahawks defense is you see the San Francisco 49ers on offense with the ball on the left. The Seahawks defense, the Legion of Boom on the right in blue. This is the defensive line. Traditionally, coaches paid most attention and spent most money and put most effort into the defensive line. They're the biggest players. They hit your opponents every time. It just seems logical. What Pete Carroll did and what the Seahawks defense did was emphasize the linebackers and the defensive backs, especially literally the last line of defense, the free safety, which is the position Carroll played in college. Now, this reminds me of the NIST cybersecurity framework. I mean, I'm <sighs> identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. I'm so old, I was in security operations before it was called security operations, when it was this. It was files, 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 we're done, because they've, they've got in. And we've realized, slowly but surely, it's all about recovery. If the last line of defense is as important, if not more important than the first. It's the whole thing together that we need to emphasize. Because looking at the NFL, looking at defense, you can have lots of plays. Your opponents can gain yards. It doesn't matter. What matters is if they score or not. In the same way, if you're breached, and if, if you're breached, but they don't take any data or they don't gain a permanent foothold on your network, all you've done is learnt more information about how you're vulnerable if you handle it, handle it right. It's the same way that we can act. Uh, again, borrowing slides, or I mean, referencing slides from Adrian Sanbria's talk from RSA conference this year. This is the way we used to think. We're hacked, we're done. When actually there's an entire kill chain your opponent needs to step through. As uh, Sunil Yu highlights in his presentation from RSA Conference 2016, a different definition of the word boom, there's the left and the right. It's not all protect, protect, protect. This is a cyber defense matrix. Really encourage you to look this up. It is an OWASP project. There does seem to be a dormant one. 
is what he's done is basically looked at all the different enterprise security market segments and mapped them to that cross-reference cross between the assets and the functions that those in, within the NIST cybersecurity framework that those enterprise market segments carry out. So as I say, he's taken all the asset classes, he's taken all the operational functions, and he's cross-referenced the two so you get an idea of what the industry is actually like. And you see here in Respond and Recover, though this is a couple of years old, there's just not much here. And especially at an OWASP meeting, realizing how many developers there are here, that massive white space is particularly industry. And it's not quite true. There are some products there, but there's a couple. And also, this recovery is so important because you don't work in cybersecurity anymore. You work in cyber resilience. The whole point is for your organization to recover from attacks and keep going, not just protect, protect, protect. We have to be resilient now. Because I mean, it used to be cyber resistance. We're now in cyber resilience. If you want to look at the, and understand the difference between the two, do read this blog by Phil Huggins. The blog title is called Black Swan Security. Um, and especially for these three, for this, it's these three points that interest me. Uh, good cyber risk decisions, the situational awareness, knowing your situation, and the pace of decision making. It's being able to recover and respond as quickly as possible, which another long string to war studies brings us to Colonel John Boyd of the United States Air Force, served in the Korean and Vietnam Wars as a Air Force pilot, so involved in a lot of dogfights, involved in a lot of air-to-air -air combat. He figured out the way to win air combat is to go through what he described as the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act. Figure out your environment, figure out where you are in relation to your enemy, decide on the best course of action, considering those two points, carry out the decision, and then just go around that loop as fast as possible. If you go around that loop faster than your opponent, you will shoot them down. But you can expand this concept, as Boyd did. It applies to any complex conflict that requires speedy reactions. Because what you need to do... Sorry, I've had a, a couple of uh, problems with this. There's a... Uh, basically, to the OODA loop, you have to go faster than your opponents. You get inside your opponent's OODA loop. That's how you guarantee victory. Um, and that's what we need to do. So, so, summary of the second lesson. Eliminate the big play. It's not hacked, done. It's a kill chain. So if you stop them early on in the chain, or if you can figure out where they're going down their chain faster than they go down it, you can stop them and recover. It's resilience over resistance. It's your speed of detection and response. The last lesson, out-hit your opponent. Now, going back to that RAND report from 1991, Another paraphrase of, the, of the, um, the first item where they looked at military analysis. The evidence of history is that soft factors, command control processes, tactics and strategy are first order determinants of both deterrence and war outcomes. Processes, tactics and strategy, yours, your opponents and your effect on your opponent's processes, tactics, and strategy. It's not just technical excellence. It's not just who's got the biggest army. It's your, it's the effect of your strategy on your opponent's strategy. So, to learn this lesson, look back at the three main members of the Legion of Boom, Sherman, Thomas, Chancellor. And now the Seahawks have a tackling method, as shown in this video from 2015, called the shoulder punch. It's literally that. You'll see Sherman coming in. You can just push the opposing quarterback out of bounds. Or you can shoulder punch them out of bounds in what is medically defined as a collision sport. You see Earl Thomas. Earl Thomas is 1 meter 78, 92 kilograms. The player he's just knocked down, so he's 1 meter 78. The player he's knocked down is 1 meter 98, and he's 120 kilograms. But really, to explain the shoulder punch to you, I need to introduce you to number 31. Cam, bam, bam, Chuck. Bam, bam, yeah. I actually got a tattoo on my shoulders. I call it my stamps. So when I hit you, it's a stamp I'm putting on you. This is why. A breach is not an incident. It is not a fire. It is not a flood. It 
is not a natural disaster like an earthquake. A breach is an attack. An attack by a human adversary with their own weaknesses. We about your day and what and think about your attackers we always say attackers have no cost I hear it again and again from instant responders what Cam Chancellor did and you see some of his most notable tackles here he was always described as setting the tone of the game you will gain yards you will score points but it will hurt all the time <laughs> that from beginning to end of the game they will hit you as hard as they can which is exactly what we don't do in cyber security if you attack us and they win damn if they attack us and they don't there's no, almost no cost to the attackers usually how a chance was described by his colleague by his teammate was he damages people's souls just people were preparing to be hit by him before they started playing the game there was an excellent uh, summary of the Legion of Boom era recently. So it says there, what made the Legion of Boom horrifying? A blend of belligerence and violence unmatched in its era. And it's that belligerence I think we're missing. Because instant response, especially in the UK, is based on like the London Metropolitan Police model. How you deal with fires, floods. Various commanders at various levels contain the issue, remove it. And I think the reason we think like this is another long string across, across that investigation wall. Reminds me of Bartle's taxonomy of player types. Pe the way people like video games, ignore the other three. What I'm interested in are the killers. If you play video games online, you know the trolls, the griefers, to be blunt, the assholes who like to beat you, like you to know that they beat you and like to beat you in the most humiliating way possible. They enjoy beating other human opponents. If you join cybersecurity and you've got that personality, you go red team, you become a pen tester. So there's not this attitude on blue team. And I agree with Haroon Mia, who says we need more hackers on defense, as he's been saying in keynotes for years. But I think also we need that hacker mindset, that hacker mentality and that belligerence is what we need to increase attacker cost. Because when we think about users, when we think about customers, when we think about the contents of a network, we say this so often, humans are the weakest link. When we look at our opponents, who are humans, nobody ever thinks, great, those crappy humans are attacking us again. What can we do against them? What, how can we take advantage of them? Everybody's all, oh, well, they're so advanced, they're so technical, they're so this, they're so that. Because your attacker starts first with the OODA loop. It's all about speed. Can you respond and react faster than your opponent? Your OODA loop starts second. But it's a relative speed. It's a relative concept. So rather than just trying to be faster, as I say, it's relative slow, your opponent's down. Now, I was reminded of what I think is the solution to this when I watched this keynote from Paul Median back in uh, April of this year, when he, explained, when he reminded me rather about Clifford Stoll, the cuckoo's egg, the first documented uh, incident response occurrence. A hacker breaks into the network. They don't want the hacker to know they're onto him. So rather than cutting him off or just letting him run riot, they tap house keys on the modem line to slow him down, to make him think the connection is worse than it is. So the first incident response started with deception, but we've seen we've lost that. And if I say, let's you know, let's bring deception into cybersecurity, everybody immediately says this: want to burn me at the stake. But if you look around, there's more people thinking about this. Samuel Shah in his this keynote and one of his axioms of cybersecurity that recommends six is to have a creative defense. It's all relatively obvious what you'll do. So your attackers can pre-plan what they'll do in your network. If you do something unexpected, or if they don't know what's there, they have to slow down. That means you can overtake them. Your OODA loop can be faster. A great presentation from London DevSecCon earlier this year. 
uh, Petco Petkov. In this context, he explained dark nets are literally networks with no traffic. If an, if an attacker stumbles onto them, they only need to send one packet, and you know an attacker is on your network. You can start figuring out where they are. Introduce deception into your infrastructure. Another great presentation was uh, Matt Pendlebury at the same uh, event earlier this year on attack-aware applications. Just a really nice idea of rather than your application is just you've wound it up and it just tries not to be hacked. Respond to attacks appropriately, maybe through deception, maybe just cutting off that connection, which of course brings us to App Sensor which is another OWASP project. Again, I'm not sure how dormant, dormant or live it is, but it's just that idea of don't just sit there and try and be as secure as you can be. As soon as your attacker reveals themselves, you don't strike back. You just make their life as difficult as possible. I mean, I basically, I want to put Bjorn's juice shop behind App Sensor and make it unhackable the exact opposite of what it's meant to be because app sensor is so good because you do one thing that looks like an attack and it will just cut you off or it will put you to a completely different virtual copy of juice shop and let you do what it's like what you like everybody else is on the real copy of juice shop that kind of the use of that kind of deception i think is what we need to do now this presentation there's only the pdf online honey pits and, Mir and mirages by Kate Pierce. It's just a really properly belligerent, Machiavellian way of thinking. I mean, I don't want to explain this. There's no time. There's only the slice of line. I just want you to see the work that's got into this, the possibilities there are, just the things you can do because of the infrastructure we've got control of now. Just how many options you have to lie to your opponents rather than that static golf course, see if you can attack, see if you can win. Just be the best attacker you can be. As soon as your attacker reveals themselves, there's so much you can do. And what's the point of this? As revealed by uh, Katie Nichols in a presentation from uh, B-Size Las Vegas earlier this year, you can learn more about your attackers. And then you can get their TTPs, you can get their behaviors, and then you can communicate it to everybody else. So you learn how your attacker would have attacked your network if you hadn't have spotted them and put them on a fake virtual network in the first place, and then you tell your entire trust network. Out hit your opponent, inflict as much pain as possible, increase attacker cost as much as possible. As advocated another presentation that's worth watching from B-Size London earlier this year, Alex Davis basically saying, we all need to talk to each other. And the MITRE attack framework gives us a language to talk to each other. As per this report released in Dutch by the Dutch Ministry of Defense on November 12th, I think, thanks to, I think it's pronounced uh, Mathegis Coot for translating it into English. And it emphasizes attribution of your opponent so you know who has attacked you. And also information sharing. So once they attack you and they're detected, you share that with everyone else. So you burn their TTPs throughout all of the uh, networks they're in. Because the way it used to be is this, Defender's Dilemma. Once they've attacked us, we're done. The way it should be, as quoted in this, that Richard Baitlick has been saying since 2009, is the Intruder's Dilemma. Once they do one thing wrong, they're detected and from there, you can start your instant response. We can expand from that. Once the intruder is detected, you can divert their attack to something else that doesn't matter, learn more about their TTPs, and share those TTPs around. Because it's related to David Bianco's pyramid of pain. If you learn the IP addresses they come from, and you tell everybody else, they just come from new IP addresses. If you learn the way they think and share that with everyone else, then they have to rebuild their entire tool chain from scratch. I mean, some of you have worked in IT long enough. What's the worst thing you've had in IT? What slows you down more than anything else is change control. What you do to your network will make such a massive difference. You need an entire committee to look it over in detail before you're allowed to do it. Make your adversaries implement ITIL, make them so worried that they're, they make one mistake and they burn their environment in all the networks they're in. They have to be so sure things will work. 
I mean, as per the Niels's um, presentation earlier today, the nature of the environment is so virtual, so ephemeral. There is so much we can do with it. I know I've referred to all sorts of presentations, but if you watch one, watch Solving Cybersecurity in the next five, in the next five years by Sun or Liu, we basically maps those NIST cybersecurity functions to the last five decades and says we're here now. It's all about recovery, which we can do because of the virtual nature of the infrastructure and integrated teams, DevSecOps, organizations, the organizations within your organization talking, talking to each other. And this is a mindset. This is a way of thinking. It's half expressed. I'm still having ideas. I need to turn it into something more concrete that we can explain, that we can argue about, that we can, we can discuss. But it's not yet another product. It's not a blinky box you can buy and install and ignore. It's something you have to do. The same as DevSecOps, the same as Agile. It's a way you have to think. Which is good it's not a product, because as Anton Chuvakin, the Gartner analyst, said earlier this year, we've got peak security product. That, surely that's it. There's only so much stuff we can buy. We've only got so much money. We've only got so many people who understand it and can install it. We need to do something different. We need to jump to a different S-curve. Because quite seriously, I've considered leaving this industry several times, but the people in this industry are so smart, I can't. What a chance to work with people like that. And we are all working so hard. But... It feels, I mean, and I have to include a Sun Tzu quote, because I've mentioned warfare at a cybersecurity conference. But the way it feels, and strategy without tactics is the slowest route to the slowest route to victory. The way it feels to me, tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat, is where we are now. So many tactics, which is all valuable. The technical talks we've had today, all useful, but it's using them in the proper way. And it's like a it's that the big idea, that strategy, I think is what we need. So what can we learn from football? Or in general, is use others' lessons. Stop getting more and more experts thinking about what we do over and over again. Practice is everything. Shift left your conflict. Eliminate the big play. It's all about responding. Out hit your opponent. It's as much about your, adver the, your adversary and the effect on them as it is about you. Or I'm wrong. Make the most of this. We can just keep trying to play golf when we're in a game of American football. Yeah, golf. Good ball. Golf. golf. No. Football. Let's watch both. Miller Lite presents Full Contact Golf. Yeah. We're still on the first hole, Bob, and this is Davis teeing it up. Here's the drive. It has blocked. Brought to you by Miller Lite. If you can combine great taste and less filling, you can combine anything. Oh, he's got daylight going for the green. Here's the putt. There's the blitz. It's good! Yeah! Oh, oh, good beer. Great taste, less filling. Can your beer do this? It's funny to watch, but I think as an industry, it's not a good plan. And it's not... I like winning. We're not winning. I think, I think we can do it differently. So that's my investigation wall and some parts of it. I've hopefully planted some ideas which will grow into prickly, belligerent cactuses in your mind. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your time. I look forward to your feedback.